Hello, folks. Welcome to the Genuinely Interested Podcast. My name is Roy Bensvi, and I'm your host. And I want to explain a little bit about the podcast before we start the show this week. This podcast is an opportunity for me to speak with some of the most interesting people I know that I can find on the internet. So either with amazing talents or achievements or just unbelievable life stories or invaluable insights into areas that they have dedicated their lives to studying. I sit down with these amazing individuals from all across the world. Really, I, I've talked to people from Slovenia to the Czech Republic to Australia to countries in Africa and South America, uh, really just all over the world. And I try to ask them the questions that will hopefully help you extract something valuable or learn something new or just get inspired by. And I do hope that you do get inspired by these talks with some sort of a call to action, maybe change something that you wanted to change for a while, or even just enjoy, you know, detaching from the world for an hour and listening to some great conversations. So whatever it is that you get from this, I do hope that you extract something from it and enjoy the conversations. All these episodes are available on all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Google, and the rest of them. You can also find the episodes on my website, which is RoyBensV.com. You can find a lot of other information about me there as well, from photos to a little bit more insights into who I am, if you're interested. And you know, you can always go to social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me there. I'm pretty active on both those platforms, although the only ones I have, and um, I try to post regularly so you can stay up to date. And also be sure to, you know, put your email on the website. Uh, I shoot emails out with updates, news, any new current information that I have will be sent via those emails and social media platforms. So yeah, make sure you're in the loop. All right. This week on the podcast, we have Richard Helsey. Richard is a naturalist ecologist, and an educator. But most importantly, he is an expert on chaparral. And for those of you who don't know what chaparral is, don't worry. I had no idea what it was either up until a few weeks ago. And I did my research and I talked to Richard and now I feel like I have the basic knowledge of what a chaparral is, how important it is to the environment in Southern California. and. I have a feeling a lot of you know it, you've seen it, you just don't know that it's a chaparral. But I'm not going to give you too much information. You're going to have to listen to the episode because Richard does a much better job of explaining what it is and how important it is to the you know, ecology and to the environment of that area. So yeah, this was a really fun episode. I wanted to talk to Richard because I saw him on a documentary about Ojai and the wildfires that they had there. and. If you've ever seen one of these documentaries about Paradise or Ojai, nothing looks more apocalyptic than one of these wildfires. And I just wanted to get a better understanding as to why they're happening at such a rapid pace and why California is more susceptible than other places. And Rick really broke it down. So if you want to learn more about wildfires, specifically in, uh, in California, check out this episode. But like I said, we cover a whole host of different things. So this was a really, really great episode. Super insightful. Rick's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. So yeah, without further ado, here is this week's guest, Richard Helsey. Enjoy the episode, everyone. The Genuinely Interested Podcast. How you doing, Rick? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, it's a pleasure. I, um, you know, I watched the documentary about Ojai. Oh, okay. And, uh, and you were on the documentary. And I've seen a few of those documentaries now. And it's scarier than any horror movie you could ever watch in your life. Yeah, well, they, um, documentarians, fire service, the press, anybody that, talks about fire, they catastrophize things and make it sound completely out of our control and it's going to come get you and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, that's sort of the way 
people are so frothed up and panicked that they're willing to do anything and suspend all rational decision making processes and turn them all over to the fire service. Yeah. Well, that's just basic human psychology, right? Every time they want us to do something, government, they'll put out propaganda, they'll use fear. Fear is the best way to motivate people to act a certain way. So that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast. Um, and yeah, maybe give us a little bit of a background. I know you're an ecologist. Right. Well, I was an educator for a long time and I took a leave of absence and I never went back in order to take care of my boys. We decided to uh, have mom work and I, I stayed home and it was wonderful. But uh, part of it was uh, funded by a grant that I got to write this natural history book on chaparral, which mm -hmm. nobody in Southern California knew much about. I mean, there's chaparral in the stores you can buy. It's ground up creosote bush, which has nothing to do with the chaparral. Um, there, the old chaparral television, Western show, there's chaparral race cars, chaparral boats. But you know, when you ask people what's surrounding them, they say, uh, forest? Well, there's no trees. Yeah. Uh, so I you have to kind of help them understand either. it. It's chaparral. So I uh, had this mission to help people appreciate it. And the 2003 Cedar Fire happened. Didn't finish the book I had started. And my publisher called me and said, this is the time. So... We got it together and had that thing published within six months, which was really quite a remarkable schedule. Yeah. And I dove into the science of fire, and it's been quite an experience ever since. Um, I was trained as a wildland firefighter at a time when most people are retiring, and it was <laughs> quite the adventure. I'm really glad I did it because I got firsthand experience uh, with the Forest Service on what was happening out there. and. Since then, I've published a few papers and done a lot of personal investigations, but I work primarily now on education, trying to help people appreciate the environment. Because unless they do, they're never going to advocate or realize it's important to protect. So I can defeat all sorts of environmentally destructive projects, which we do. We go to court sometimes. But it's like whack-a-mole, right? I mean, unless the population embraces nature and understands where it fits into their life, it, it um, it's kind of a losing battle. Yeah. So maybe because I personally, I had no, I've, I, ne I never even heard the term chaparral <laughs> up until a couple of weeks ago. And, and I don't know, maybe that's because I'm on the East Coast and I don't think we have it because I think it's no. California or Southern California, right? If I'm not mistaken. Right. It's primarily throughout the central and southern portion of Southern California, but there's a lot of it in Northern California. It goes up into Southern Oregon. There's a kind of a disjunct patch in Arizona. It goes down to Baja. Uh, but the Arizona chaparral component is a little different because it has winter rainfall, which, excuse me, summer rainfall, which we don't have in, in California. And then there's a patch of chaparral in western texas and interestingly enough it's lining the eastern sides of all the major mountain chains in mexico all the way down to oaxaca now there they don't have the fire issue which is a, a dominant issue for us in california but still it's it's got some of the same species um it's called mexical down there it's not called chaparral but um it's in a lot of different places but people don't notice it because it's um <laughs> you know, we're we're culturally and I think almost genetically attracted to forests and trees and grasslands. And that stuff in between doesn't count because you can't really walk through it sometimes. <laughs> um, and in this particular point in time in our civilization's history, it catches fire and it causes homes to burn. So people don't like it. Yeah, people don't like it. I mean, it's. I think it's because it's maybe also so ubiquitous. It's right. It looks like it's just everywhere. It covers all the mountains there. And we're more attracted to like rare things, like things that right. ooh, we have to go on a search to find rather than something that's just covered half right. the state. Right. I think so. <laughs> what, uh, so why, why Chaparral? What attracted you to Chaparral? I was teaching biology in my enclosed climate control classroom, except I was the only classroom that had a door outside. So I always kept it open. And I remember distinctly, I was teaching some brilliant lecture on photosynthesis or something. And 
I had the door propped open. It was November and the sycamore leaf came in and was spinning on the linoleum floor. And it just sort of caught my eye. And I thought to myself, why am I teaching biology indoors? <laughs> so I took the kids down to the canyon next to the school. Uh, we made sort of a trail going down. A couple, couple of kids fell, they got dirty. And this is high school. Yeah. A few of them were upset. Um, but it started a whole project for me to connect kids with the natural environment. So we started going down there twice a week. We'd meet in the parking lot and go down and spend an hour. And we ended up... Uh, having a major part of my curriculum and end of the year, we'd always have this, what we call bio night and they'd celebrate what their projects had been. And, but I didn't know really what I was descending into as a Canyon and there were trees down at the bottom, but on the hillsides, it was, it was this weird shrubby stuff. <laughs> so that's when I found out about it. Cause I had never heard about it either. Yeah. And then I realized the nuances of it all. There's different kinds of chaparral, Sometimes it integrates into another shrubland called sage scrub. And then some of the species are just remarkable. And it's it's kind of like, you know, when you buy a new car, you see them everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> the whole world opened up to me in a way that I'd never experienced before. So the chaparral to me is like a discovery every day. And it's sometimes not so much what I know, it's what I don't know. Because I'll notice things now that aren't familiar to me or don't seem to belong. And the things I, I know help me highlight the things I don't. So it's always a wonderful experience. And people have it in any natural environment they they like to hang out in. It's just that chaparral isn't particularly thought of in that regard. It just takes a little extra effort. But once you realize it, it's just a beautiful ecosystem. I mean, there's used to be the home to the California grizzly bear. Most people don't realize that because they associate bears with forests and Grizzly bears didn't like forests for the most part. They they love chaparral. And of course, the last one here in California was seen in 1929 uh, in in, or 24, in the, uh, somewhere in the 20s, I think, in the sequoias. So they're all gone now. And they probably had a pretty major ecological role, but we don't know what, really what it was. And there's these beautiful manzanitas, which most people have heard that name. It's uh, sort of a, sometimes it can be a pretty big shrub, arboresque kind of shrub has bright red bark and these little berries, beautiful little urn, upside down urn shaped flowers that about a month from now they'll be following because they're all covering the shrubs right now, which in really? your terrain is like winter, right? Well, it's spring here now. <laughs> yeah. And those little white flowers will cover the ground. So that's our snow in, <laughs> in Los Angeles. Yeah, Southern California has some insane climate. I mean, it it is it's almost it's almost a different country, right? I mean, only a few other places in the world have that type of climate, right? Right. There's uh, four other ones. There's uh, uh, Western Australia. There's um, the Mediterranean South climate, Africa. of course. There's uh, Central Chile, South Africa, and it kind of pans around those areas, but. Interestingly enough, I mean, even though they represent a very small portion of the Earth's habitats, they they have an outsized percentage of of endangered species and species in general. Yeah, if I can take you back to the bears for a second, why specifically were the grizzly bears targeted? Because you still have black bears and brown bears, right? And now I know grizzly bears are predominantly in in central uh like midwest and colorado utah those type of places they're not really by by the shores you know unless maybe maybe more upstate i don't know exactly but i know yeah, they're up in alaska yeah they're in yeah. alaska montana basically where people aren't yeah um, even though there's lots of people in australia excuse me uh, alaska up there watching the grizzly bears and but you know we're still coming out of this mindset if it moves shoot it whether it's uh, people that don't look like you or an animal. Mm -hmm. And that's just what people did. They killed grizzly bears and they were big. It was difficult for them to hide. And that's why the, the last ones were way up in the mountains where people generally didn't go. And if you disturb them, they've got an attitude like us. They don't like to be bothered. And so they kill people sometimes. And, you know, it's not something people tolerate and then there's also the thing they'll predate on farm animals sometimes and so it's like a lot of things we just have exploited the landscape to the point where you can take a walk now pretty much anywhere in north america and not be afraid 
because we killed everything that <laughs> used to live out there. I mean, there's still cougars. There's uh, grizzly bears up in Montana. But for the most part, they've learned to Cougars have learned how to stay away from us. They almost got taken out in California, but we passed a law here to make it illegal to shoot them. There's still some down in Florida. But yeah, we just um, took them out. Yeah, we have in the, here in the East Coast, in New England, we have uh, black bears. And uh, they're smaller, uh, tamer, I think. Like, I don't know. Yeah. So we had one in our backyard maybe three <laughs> months ago. Seriously, I, I wake up in the morning, I look out the window, and he's just there, just nonchalantly passing through doesn't it doesn't really care about like i went outside to shoot like to take you know video didn't really care about me he couldn't care less if i was there if i wasn't there you know and uh we've seen bobcats coyotes and it just seems like their areas you know they have less and less area to go to therefore they're coming into the more right suburban territories to you know get the food or shelter whatever it is they need well, they're somewhat um, like coyotes. Coyotes are the only mammal that I'm aware of that is a native mammal that has actually expanded its range since uh, humans showed up. And part of that's because we've eliminated a lot of predators. But uh, black bears seem to have figured us out, and they are a lot tamer. I mean, they will take off your car door <laughs> to, yeah. to get to the food. But yeah. for the most part, you're okay. I've encountered them a lot on the trail in the Sierra Nevada. But a lot of them nowadays, especially in California, don't belong where they are because the grizzly bear did not tolerate them at all. So that's why black bears are primarily mountain bears. And now they're coming down in the foothills and Interesting. taking swims. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we have this God complex where we like to, I don't know, based on arbitrary decisions that we make, what should live, what shouldn't. And we screw around with ecosystems all the time, right? We take out top predators. And we think, okay, that's it. We're done. And then the whole host of problems start developing because there's not a top predator to look after the ecosystem, right? With wolves, it happens. With sharks, it's happening. With bears and, you know, other top apex predators. Exactly. Well, I don't know if you've seen that book, uh, excuse me, the, the movie, uh, How Wolves Change Rivers. It's about the story yeah. in Yellowstone. Beautiful. Yeah, it really is. And I think about that when I think about the loss of the grizzly bear and what his or its removal meant to the ecosystem, it, we'll never know because they're gone. And by the time anybody really cared, they were gone. And so nobody really studied them. But, you know, when you take an apex predator out of the system, it really has incredibly complex cascading impacts, all of which are negative. And even plants have the same kind of thing. Like, in, in chaparral, there's a handful of species, plants that are dominant. And if there's too many fires, for example, they are removed from the system. And then a cascade of just horrible <laughs> consequences occur. Species become extinct. Weeds come in. So, yeah, the, the whole thing is uh, pretty pretty interconnected. Yeah, it's it's like that story in Australia where they brought over these uh, massive toads to eat. Um, oh. I forget, yeah, there was some pest that was that was eating, you know, the, the the food that they were growing. So they're like, all right, let's bring this toad. This toad will take care of this pest. And then these toads just their their population is so massive they can't control them now. They're just widespread all over the whole east coast and, and northern coast of Australia. So it's just every time we try to play God, we end up failing. Yep. Well, and you know what's interesting is, glad you brought that up. I mean, every single decision we make like that, at the time we think, well, of course, the science per se, whatever it might be at the time, supports it. Everybody's in favor of it. And it turns out to be a disaster. And we don't seem to be <laughs> understanding our, our, our problems with our egos and our hubris. It's just like right now, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, declarations about how we need to prescribe burn everything in California. You may have heard that. I mean, every time you hear it, well, we got to start burning more, you know, and everybody, well, all right. So if every land management decision you've made in the last 150 years, however long you want to say that Europeans have been having a major impact here in, in California, in North America, every one of them has, has gone astray. And at every time they, they were so convinced. What, one thing people don't know is 
the National Park Service in the 30s, I mean, their, their primary policy was to eliminate all top predators from every national park. So they went out and poisoned them, shot them. They didn't trap them, move them. They just got rid of them. And, and now, what, and they were just convinced that's what we needed to do. So now what's happening? We spent millions and millions of dollars trying to restore the habitats we thought was in need of repair. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just a continual not learning from history. It applies to everything, right? <laughs> It does, in a hundred percent. So, I mean, this narrative that that I hear, I've, I've heard it a bunch of times from, I don't know, different people um, that controlled fires could be the solution, and it's just poor forest management. There's nothing, no, that doesn't hold any water. That's not a good argument. No, it's ridiculous. And here, I mean, can you can you explain why? <laughs> sure. So, that, there's a number of issues. <clears throat> The primary issue I think we're trying to address when we talk about control fires and, is human safety and, and protection of communities. I mean, that's really what I think it's supposed to be about. And, and that's what's gotten everybody um, focused on this. So their assumption is if we do all these controlled or prescribed burns, they call them prescribed now because controls, <laughs> A lot of these get out of control, so they've kind of dropped that word. <laughs> yeah. uh, we won't have, if we do these fires, we, we, won't, we won't have the big ones, you know? We'll burn up all the, the fuel and, and we'll be okay. And by the way, a further assumption is Native Americans did that and they never had big fires. So that entire narrative is wrong. Large, high intensity fires are part of a lot of ecosystems. Uh, there, long before the era of fire suppression, there were huge fires in California, uh, way back before Europeans got here. So there's been numerous papers that have confirmed each other's conclusions and that there were usually two to three just huge mother fires in California every century. Okay. And there were a few little ones, but for the most part, they were all big, the big ones. And, and and, and why is that? Well, because these fires are not fuel limited, if you want to think of it that way. They're, they're given the right conditions, a fire will carry and continue on until it hits the ocean. And, and those conditions are long term drought, dry, hot weather, and strong winds. And it doesn't matter whether it's grass, 10 year old recovering, people like to call vegetation from the previous fire a thin forest, a thick forest, the fire is going to continue until the weather changes. Every firefighter knows this. But it provides us a mechanism by which well, we can do something. We can't seem to get our heads around the fact that there's nothing we can do to stop large, high-intensity fires. It, it just It's going to happen because it's a function of weather. It's not about what's on the ground. And I'll give you an example. Um, a decade or so ago, there was a huge <clears throat> fire in, in Oklahoma and Texas. Millions of acres. I think a couple dozen people died. A lot of homes lost. It was a grass fire. Which, by the way, one of the common denominators for firefighter fatalities is the presence of grass. Because everybody thinks, oh, that's not a problem. I can... I can control that. Well, you can't because there'll be a condition where all of a sudden there's a flare up. It moves so fast and it's so hot so quick. It it kills people. Yeah. You know, yet <laughs> you'll hear people that are off their firefighter training, which is a major component is this grass lesson. You get up in management and people forget that. And you'll have firefighters saying, well, I'll I'd rather confront a grass fire any day to a forest fire. Mm -hmm. They've forgotten their training. I mean, that's where everybody died was in the grass because they've got that attitude, you know? So backing up again, uh, the controlled or the, the prescribed burn story provides us comfort because it provides us what we think is a way to fix this problem. <clears throat> and they like to bring up when people talk about this Native Americans because that taps into our collective guilt about what we've done to these people. 
Well, we're, we're actually appropriating their culture when we go in this direction because the landscapes they used fire on, which they did a lot to uh, manipulate the environment, to bring more vegetation of their liking around their settlements. All those areas now are under Walmart parking lots and freeways. They lived on the coastal plain and up in flatland areas. They traveled through all of California, but their management of landscapes happened where they lived. That's where our cities are now. Yeah. And so to, to, to imagine this incredibly connected uh, nature related population that was dependent on how they were able to collect food to, to carefully roam the entire region of California doing all these prescribed burns. I mean, it's about the most fantastical, <laughs> you know, sort of image I can think of. I mean, these people, they love the land. They weren't up there randomly burning things just because they have some, you know, degree in ecology. They were trying to survive. Yeah. And they were doing the burning around their villages. But again, those places are gone. They're under, you know, concrete. So for us to bring that up as, as a, a rationale to support what we want to do, which, by the way, is heavily invested in financial interests and, and careers. Yes, Native Americans use fire, but our destruction of their village sites and everything else that they held dear um, is just another continuation of what we've always done is using Aboriginal people's land, their culture or whatever to pursue our own means, you know. And cultural burning is an important component of a lot of Native American peoples now. It's one of the few things they can, you know, still do. And, the, and society now says, oh, it's okay. So it has even a greater sense of uh, satisfaction. But to try to apply this, this story to a landscape now that doesn't exist, first of all, <laughs> that's threatened by climate change, that has millions of people lighting fires every which way from Sunday, and has invasive non-native weeds uh, that make the landscape more flammable, you know, what the places they want to do these prescribed fires are areas that we have yet destroyed. They it's the, the last vestige of wild in California and the, and the West. So they want to go in and do this. And honestly, it's it's not about saving lives and property. It's about biomass companies, logging companies, and fire agencies, frankly, whose entire budget at some point is based on clearing vegetation or doing something in relation to it, fire suppression or whatever. It's a lot of money that's driving these decisions. It's not so much safety. Yeah, that's usually what drives most of the decisions that happen <laughs> at the top. It's usually financial yeah. interest. But to you know, to to just point out a couple of things that you were saying, our our whatever they were doing three four hundred years ago, it's almost like you said, it's not applicable. Our climate is different nowadays. No, but because of climate change, and like you said before, you would have what two, three, four massive wildfires each century. It seems like now we have those every year. It seems yeah. like every year. It's hotter now. November was the hottest November on record. And again, it's like every time it's like, this is the biggest wildfire. This is the biggest wildfire. Every year, it's the biggest wildfire. So what makes California specifically so susceptible to these massive, massive wildfires? I, I have to say um, it's, it's probably the result of, of two factors. The first is climate change. The landscape's just getting drier. Yeah. And dry landscapes burn more than wet landscapes. I mean, you don't have massive fires in Minnesota for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's wet all the time. <laughs> you turn off the water up there and it'll be California in a heartbeat. Yeah. This is an idea I just don't understand why people don't get. It's just, you know, we have big fires because it's dry. The other thing is population. You, you've got people doing stupid things, doing normal things, lighting fires. And yeah, a lot of the, uh, well, not a lot, but a few of the big fires recently in, here in California were caused by lightning. 
Um, but, you know, a lot of those were propelled by non-native grasses. And so that has added sort of kindling to the landscape in a way that there's no coming back from that. I mean, we can't get rid of those things. And this is the other issue most people don't understand. I mean, these areas where Native Americans used to live, it was either bare ground or there was, you know, spotted areas with perennial grasses or or now there any available space that's been disturbed gets filled with these European and North African grasses. And they're so good at what they do. They outcompete all the natives and they made the environment more flammable. So, you know, what do we do? <laughs> we go out and build fuel breaks and grind up the vegetation. And guess what comes back in its place? Grasses, which then makes the landscape more flammable than it was in the first place. And I just scratched my head thinking, would you, <laughs> you know, remember your firefighter training, see what happens. Why are you doing this? And I think I'm going to fall back on what you were saying earlier. It's it's honestly a lot of it. It's about the money. Yeah. And also it allows agencies to say we're doing something right. Yet they lose thousands of homes a year. If you were a general and you were in charge of this militaristic operation and you lost thousands of troops, I mean, you wouldn't have a job anymore. But for some reason, we, we just throw our hands up and say, oh, well, we lost 1,500 homes in this fire. It's inexcusable. <laughs> There's yeah. things we can do to stop that. But uh, it's not the way we're going now. So if, you know, controlled fires are not the solution, if you had a magic wand, right, and someone said, here's $10 billion, you know, how do you take care of this? Are, are some solutions, for example, having people not build in certain areas because, you know, people want to view, people want to live in these coveted spots. Maybe those are just not the spots for people to build. Maybe we should move them to another area or I don't know. What, what are some solutions? So this gets complicated because people don't like to be told what to do, right? But, but yeah. There are zoning laws, which we've concurred that that's okay. So if you've got a prop, piece of property and you're a private property owner and you want to build your house out in the middle of this incredibly hazardous place, I, I say go for it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you've got developers who are buying land and building communities for profit in areas that are extremely dangerous, that shouldn't be allowed. Because what happens is they build it. Everybody lies to everybody. <clears throat> they pretend like it's not going to be a problem. And then 30, 40 years later, you've lost a thousand homes and 10 people have died. And, and this has happened over and over again. The Fountain Grove community in the Tubbs Fire in Santa Rosa, it was built on this landscape that people were trying to protect and preserve because of the habitat value, but also the fire risk. That entire area in 1964 got burned in the Hanley fire, almost the same perimeter that the Tubbs fire did. And it went right over the Fountain Grove area. <clears throat> well, so when the Tubbs fire came through, you, you look at these overlays of, of on Google Earth of what happened there. Every single home is just, it's gone. And they were warned, this is a fire hazard. You shouldn't be building here. Well, the community... Leaders, it's a tax base expansion. You know, we have a housing crisis. We, okay, well, you just, how many people died because of that? And and they figure, I don't know, rationally, oh, by the time that happens, I'll be either dead or <laughs> retired and I won't be held accountable. I think instead of going after utilities, because that's where the money is, you know, because a lot of these fires get sparked by their down power lines, we ought to file civil suits for criminal negligence against the people that approve those developments in the first place. And that means the cities, the, 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 the planning commissions, and, and put some of these people in, in the place of responsibility that they, they, they have avoided. And you'll see these developments stop in a hurry <laughs> yeah. if, if that kind of thing uh, happens. And it's not that you can't build in hazardous areas. It's just that, People are people, and from the moment you build a community, 
it begins to become more fire hazardous because stacks of wood build up, the wood fence starts to decay, the pine trees grow up and drop needles in the tree, the play equipment, you know, what happens, right? Um, and unless you got some authoritarian uh, homeowners association that roams around, <laughs> and they do have these, <laughs> and if your lawn is an inch higher than it should be, they, they slap you with a fine. You know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, if you want to live in a normal community with people that just like to live their own life, and um, you, you can't do that. So, but you can make houses pretty fireproof if the community and 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 the government and everybody's on the same page. But at the moment, everybody's all over the place, and they're still doing things that haven't worked for a hundred years. Yeah, and I mean, it's so heartbreaking honestly if you watch these places like ojai and paradise and a lot of other communities you just you come back after these wildfires there, there, there's nothing left and then i don't know what they do but either they rebuild or they leave these areas and and it's funny because you see this in other areas right like for example miami seawater is rising that's just a fact but they're you know coastline properties are at an all-time high people are buying left <laughs> and right as if like your apartment's not going to be potentially underwater in 30 years. So I just don't know. There's a dissonance here that, that I don't either people don't care. And there's and like you said, like they're like, you know what? This is 30 years from now. This is a good investment. I'm, I'm going to keep doing this and we're going to keep building like as close to the water as possible or as close to these, I don't know, fire corridors as possible, even though, you know, I could lose my home. The thing about the fire is it's actually worse because sea seawater rising it's it's like 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 we said it's 5 10 20 30 years from now but i think wildfires it's just it doesn't seem like it's going to get any better it seems like they're going to get bigger and and more violent with each passing year so uh, what are people thinking and is there something that you're seeing that maybe there's a bit of a change now with some of these recent massive wildfires well that's a great question i i think <clears throat> i'll answer your question and the last one I never really got around to about the magic wand um, in a couple <laughs> yeah. different parts. You still, so, the, you still have the magic wand. You still have. <laughs> so we, we have a genetic problem here. Um, we, we react. We're just really lousy at planning. And that plays out in so many different dimensions. So, I mean, the, the, the first thing is to recognize you do have to look ahead and plan 20, 30, 40 years out. It goes against our cultural dynamics too. So how you change that, I don't know. For example, you know, the Montecito mudslide that happened uh, in that little town north of, uh, south of Santa Barbara, uh, totally predictable. Did they have a plan? Uh, well, people were tired because they'd evacuated because of the Thomas fire. And so, you know, they, there was that excuse. Well, they really didn't have an appropriate plan. Okay, so let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. All right, well, everybody forgot and, and people were tired. About 10 miles up the coast is another canyon, a Mission Canyon, where the Santa Barbara Mission is, the museum's there, and a whole bunch of development. You'd think that the city people and the planners, which is what government's supposed to do, they look at these situations, they go, ah, that's the next one. Let's develop an evacuation plan. Let's get everybody educated. Is that happening? No. <laughs> I mean, there's boulders the size of houses in the uh, botanical park there. Yeah. Where did they come from? They came from a Montecito mudslide a couple hundred years ago. So they've got the evidence right in front of them, yet they still won't do it. And they keep falling back to what they've always done. Well, let's do some vegetation thinning or some prescribed burns. So here's what I'd like to do. First of all, restrict development from these extremely high fire zone areas. And I'm talking public, large commercial de developments. Yeah. I think people who own property, sure. But don't expect the fire service to come help you. I mean, they need to sign a rider or some kind of thing when they build their property. It's part of the permit. Um, I will not hold the fire department responsible. I know I'm responsible for my own fire protection. That'd be, I mean, that's not a difficult thing to understand. I mean, we used to do that, you know, the whole community used to 
support the fire and we know it's going to come and there was fire volunteer fire departments but now we've totally thrown this onto the government right oh i can't you know so we evacuate and people die on the road and we don't understand what's wrong so the first thing we we have to do the homes that are already built that are in fire high fire zone areas we need to retrofit them in ways that allow them to resist embers and embers are the things that take out all the homes and they take out all the homes in only 5% of the fires, which are wind driven. Now, the fire service will say, well, we need to do these prescribed burns and fuel treatments because they'll, you know, they'll allow us to control 95% of the fires. I don't care about the 95%. The people that are dying, the homes that are burning are in those 5% fires and the fire service turns a blind eye to it. Well, you know, okay. So you can retrofit homes with ember resistant vents um, fireproof roofing, and all sorts of things, before you even talk about vegetation, that'll keep the home from being burned down from embers. And that includes having properly maintained, properly spaced vegetation and trees around your home. For one reason, one reason alone, it stops the embers from targeting your home. It's happened time and time again. And also exterior sprinklers. Uh, they do this in Australia. They do it in Canada. They save homes all the time. I, I don't understand where, why, why we're so against it. I think part of it is the paradigm of the interior sprinkler thing. So after we lost so many people in these urban conflagrations, you know, um, they mandated interior sprinklers. So why did they do that? To save the building? No, to save lives. Well, that's when fires started inside of homes. Yeah. Now these devastating fires start from outside the house and we keep mandating interior sprinklers. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, rearranging these deck chairs isn't really gonna help. Let's put the sprinklers outside. The resistance I get to that idea is absolutely mind blowing. But are sprinklers um, really gonna be able to ward off these humongous, like in Ojai when it was just coming down this, this valley, would sprinklers really hold that off? Okay, this is when the second component of this works. You get the community to be fire savvy and we stop putting everything on the fire service. So you establish these neighborhood fire watch groups, you know, like they have these neighborhood watch groups to you know, keep the criminals away. Yeah. And there's, I don't know, a couple dozen people that volunteer. A lot of people love this. They, they, they get certified um, to be emergency responders, the CERT system. There's some ham radio operators. They learn how to get, uh, you know, their red card, which is the thing you get with the forest service to learn how to fight fires. They get their Nomex pants and their boots and they put them up on the, and every year they practice, we're gonna have a fire today. And so the whole community, and they've actually developed an evacuation plan that works, <clears throat> not one for the, you know, the, the event that we can control, which is what they always seem to be doing. And then these two dozen people, they don't evacuate. They stay in the community to put out the spot fires with their cocktails, which is essentially what can happen. They hit the sprinklers and they're in charge of protecting their community, which is what we used to do. Is it risky? Yeah, there's some risk in it. But I mean, what we're seeing now is not acceptable. And so if you have a community that's, that's, that's organized like this, um, the sprinklers, are, you can have a, you know, Cadillac model that costs you thirty thousand dollars with automatic things, or you can just have one you hit a, but, a button on. Um, and a lot of people have pools, so that's your water source. Or get a water tank. That's about five grand, and you have to be off the grid in case things happen um, the wrong way and the power goes out. So you have a, a, a gas or diesel pump, and it it all can be accomplished with within about. $10,000 easily. That's a lot of money to a lot of people. Yeah. But a lot of these homes that burned are multi-million dollar homes. So we, you know, and then for uh, uh, trailer parks and, and areas that, that people can't afford that, that's when the community comes in. Give them grants. That, there's an incredible picture of, of what happened in Paradise. There was, there was a trailer park with about 100 plus trailers, just decimated. The entire forest around the trailer park is green. What happened? Well, the embers. Okay. They had enough time to hit that sprinkler button 
if they had had like five community water tanks and that's all they were designed to do was in the event of a fire, hit the switch and there's 10 people in the trailer park that don't evacuate. And they run around and take care of, you know, the woman who's 95 that couldn't evacuate anyway. They're going to take care of her. But what happened in paradise? Um, well, just by luck, there was a firefighter that said, oh, gosh, let's bring everybody in this parking lot and we'll you know, hunker down there. Why wasn't that part of the evacuation plan? <laughs> I mean, it was like a spur of the moment thought. And he saved yeah. dozens of people. Yeah. What? I mean, why is that such an accidental event? And so it just blows my mind that these answers are so readily available. But you see, I'll give you a little story. Um, in the in the 20s and the 30s, there was a Oakland Hills fire, Berkeley fire, that just devastated the community. They passed an ordinance to outlaw shake shingles. You know how long, long that ordinance lasted? About six months. The shake shingle industry lobbied the city council, and they got it repealed. That was one of the factors in the 1990s uh, Oakland Hills fire that was, up until recently, the most devastating fire this entire uh, state had ever seen lives lost and property damage. Um, that was responsible for some of the problems in that fire. Well, guess what? They've passed a lot of ordinances now to outlaw not only shake shingles, but require fireproof roofing, right? Well, how come they've stuck? What do you think the answer is? Financial? Yeah, there's no shake shingle industry anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's nobody to lobby against it. And so the problem we're having right now is there's no financial interest or lobby to support ember resistant vents. It's all mom and pop operations. There's a guy in um, uh, a town in the uh, Western Sierra. I'll think about it in a minute. Murphy's. And he's bought a whole bunch of these exterior sprinkler systems that you can put on your house for less than 200 bucks. And he says, I can't believe people's attitudes in town. Well, my insurance will cover it. I don't want to mess with that kind of thing. You know, <laughs> and I, I bought a, this little kit. It comes in a box, you know, uh, about two shoe, shoe box sizes. And there are two sprinklers. And if you got a thousand foot house, you put one on one end, one on the other end of the roof. You tap it into your municipal water system and it works great. Okay, so what's my next step? Well, in case the system goes down, I'll get a tank and a, and a portable pump. Well, actually, I have a pool, so I won't, I won't need the tank. But I mean, it, it's such a simple thing. And not only does the house get protected because it's wet, because wet, ho wet houses don't burn, the surrounding vegetation gets saturated. So there's a humidity level. And so, you know, you've got this island of, of hydrated habitat that protects your home now. So anyway, that, there's your magic wand solution. <laughs> and some of the reasons why it doesn't doesn't happen. But a lot the problem is also a lot of these areas are drought stricken, right? Are what? Drought stricken. Like there's a lot of drought in this area. That's why it's why it's so dry. That's why you have the wildfires. But then yes. you need all this extra water to protect. It's it's a little, you know, it's probably I don't know. It's not tough for them to get. They can get water, but it's just it's weird that you need more water to protect an area that already has drought. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. You know, water is sort of the answer. Um, you know, it's you interesting. The, the, the Woolsey fire, a lot of buildings were protected because they had exterior sprinklers. Um, the, the visitor center in Malibu State Creek basically survived. Well, it did survive because they had these rainbirds on its roof, I think, whether they were rainbirds or whatever. But anyway, yeah. There's um, a guy, I, I don't remember what city or state this was, but maybe it was California. And he had what was almost kind of a moat around his house. It was this rubber uh, pool-like, I don't know. I don't know exactly. It was a tube. And he just put it around his house. And there was a video of his house after this massive wildfire. And his house was the only house in the neighborhood that survived. And uh, I guess there was some company that was looking into producing these. I, I never looked into it, but it was just, uh, I, I got reminded of it now. So. You know, back home, for example, I'm I'm from Israel because it's uh there's a history of of wars, right, and, and rockets falling and all the fun that happens in the Middle East. Um, they 
when you build a new house, right, you have to, by law, one of the rooms has to have, it's not exactly a bunker, but it's it's kind of like a bunker where the it's the 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 cement or the walls are much thicker and it's ah. inside. So every house has to have that. And I was thinking like in California, or at least in these areas that are prone, like could the state mandate every house being built? I don't know, under, you know, underground bunker or some room <laughs> yeah. that, that people could escape to. Could they do something like that? Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that would, that, that's your last resort, right? In, in case yeah. things go haywire. Exactly. But honestly, if, if you've done your, your homework and you've managed the vegetation properly and you've got a pretty fire safe house, you're okay. You know, it sounds weird, but, um, and you'll, you know, hear about these, you'll see these pictures of these 300 foot flames and, you know, the, the fire columns and the fire tornadoes and yeah, that stuff happens, but, you know, fire stops when there's nothing else to burn. It just stops dead in its tracks or if it's, if it's wet. Um, so, you know, the research is, is really clear that you just have your environment properly managed and it doesn't mean clear cut. It doesn't mean a, a, a concrete bunker. It means just sort of rational everyday kinds of things you can do. You'll be okay. Um, and it sounds like that's not possible, but you know, the, the, the issue with a lot of these developments, one, once, once, once one home starts to ignite, then you're in trouble because a lot of these homes are too close together. It throws off heat numbers. And now it's a domino kind of a thing. And that's where your fire brigade or fire safe group or whatever comes into place. Um, you know, the community of Coffee Park that burned in um, the Tubbs fire at Santa Rosa 2017, I think. Um, it, it were these little, I don't know, 1,800 square foot homes, single stories, trailers in the backyards. It, it, it was five miles from any wildland of any significance. Um, they, if there had just been a couple dozen people in that community, the, the houses all started burning from little flames, you know, in a pile of leaves. I mean, you could see the ember land and it catches fire. It isn't this tidal wave of flame that moves through. It's, it, it's the ember thing, which is very manageable if you've got <laughs> the training to deal with it. Yeah. Foresight. Well, the other thing is you have massive, like the air quality after these wildfires is, I'm assuming, horrendous. Oh, yeah. And then on top of that, you have the scorched surface, right, where, you know, when you have rainfall, it doesn't penetrate and it just creates these massive mudslides and floods. Yep. And then and then the other problem, you know, there's a scene in this in this movie that I swear I almost cried when you see this poor bear you know, just half burnt, um, just coming up the, the, this little like valley, um, just begging for, for water, you know, and that's the other thing we, it's, you know, out of sight, out of mind, these wildlife that is just being decimated by these wildfires. And, and, and like, there's a, I'm sure you've seen it. There's a famous video in Australia where this woman is saving this koala, uh, that's kind of like, burnt and almost attached to this tree and it's just you know a, a fire is just it's the worst way to go and it's just it's so heartbreaking to see these animals having to go through this yeah it is i am um, you know fire has been with us for a long time um but these fires in rapid succession like this have not um and that that is just heartbreaking because it it never allows systems to go through their natural processes. It just hammers them over and over, and the animals are decimated. And in Australia, they've got some problems now because, I mean, fire has been part of that system for a long time. But because of climate change and, and, and longer than normal droughts, and then the people, of course, these fires are just really actually taking things out yeah. where they didn't used to do this before. Uh, so. And I, I try to, I, I try to be optimistic about things, but unless we get a handle on this climate change issue, for for me anyway, the chaparral 
the state's got a prediction here that within a century, it's basically gone from Southern California. Um, and so what, what would that mean to the landscape if, if that's gone? Well, it's going to be ugly. Um, it's going to be more fire prone. The walks that you take with your dog is, are going to be uh, episodes of foxtails in their ears and uh, <laughs> not too many uh, pleasant feelings in your socks. Um, and the landscapes and the green we love will only happen, well, at least the green anyway, for a couple months right after the rains because the shrubs will be gone. Yeah. Um, and all we'll be filled with is rolling hills of brown grass, which some people seem to like. Um, you know, a lot of the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose, you drive through there. And a lot of that landscape used to be coastal sage scrub and chaparral. It's, it's all grasses now. There's a couple islands of chaparral. And people think that's normal. Well, it's not normal. <laughs> we created that by overgrazing, over fire, over burning. I mean, you know, one of the things they uh, used to do smelting in California where they would stack <clears throat> piles of logs and then a mountain of ore on top of it. And I forget what they were pulling out of there, copper or something. And they needed to get the sulfur out of the material to do one of their processes, I think. And they would light these logs and and the the fumes from these events would go up slope, kill people, absolutely make a moonscape of the ecosystem. And towns, who knows long-term health effects if they didn't die right away. And this happened throughout the gold country and, and the and you know the mining districts. You can still go back today. It's like hydraulic mining, which you may have heard of, where they use these giant hoses. You can still see scars of these kinds of events. Nature, nature's never come back. I mean, it's come back in a kind of a limpy way. Yeah. But wow, and that was a hundred years ago. So yeah, I you know the future. Uh, I think we the secret is honestly to get back to what I said originally. We have to come home again, and when I mean home come back to outdoors and nature because we're inside with a refrigerator and our computer now and, you know, our, our tension levels, blood pressure, heart rates, uh, immune systems are all compromised. You go outdoors, your heart rate's reduced, blood pressure goes down, immune system is enhanced, killer T cell counts go up just by being outdoors. Yeah. Uh, your stress levels re are reduced hormone-wise. This is why there's posters of forests and 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 uh, like scenes of nature in your dentist and, and and doctor's offices. Just seeing green improves your health. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this was proved by this gallbladder doctor in the 80s who does a study back east. And he put patients on two parts of the hospital. One part faced the park, one part faced the other hospital building. The patients in that part of the hospital that overlooked the park, the nurses liked them better. They asked for less drugs, and their recovery rate was significantly better compared to the other group. What's going on? Well, they're looking back at home. It felt good. You know? <laughs> so I think once people learn how to reconnect with nature, then the rhythms and the things that are out there become part of who they are, and they don't maybe want to control as much. And then they they adapt to the environment and instead of trying to pretend we can adapt to it. I mean, we can force it to adapt to us, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and have a little more respect, which would be stop putting so much carbon in the air. <laughs> um, that would be and all the other poisons we throw out there. Yeah. There so was it's, also it's the long-term solution. <laughs> I mean, you can sue people, pass laws, and do all sorts of stuff. And that kind of works eventually. But I think we're running out of time. So we got to strip start working on our psychology. Yeah. There was a study a few years back, I remember, um, where they they split up, I think this was in New York, they split up uh, this area that was, I guess, kind of like a ghetto area. Yeah. And half the area was near the wooded area, it was near a park, and the other had like nothing, it was just bare bones. 
And literally the people that on the other half next to the park, it was less crime. Like they're all the, all the stats that you want, they were better at. And the other side was worse at. Yeah. Right. And it's just, it's amazing. Just what a little bit of, of trees and park does for you. Right. And, and I think that's what, when people look in at, at California, you know, usually they think of LA, they think of San Francisco, maybe San Diego. Um, and it, it, they just think of these massive cities, but California is so diverse, right? You got the highest mountain, the hottest desert, beautiful beaches. You got the tallest trees, the most national parks. Um, it grows, I think, half of the country's fruit and vegetables. Uh, it's perfect, like wine climate, beautiful snowboarding resorts. It's so diverse. It's got literally everything in one state. But I, I fear, you know, because cities will, they should be okay. But like a lot of these things are could be substantially affected by climate change in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> not to be, not to be completely depressing, but it's just, it's, you know, there's no way to talk about this without being a little gloom and doom, unfortunately. Well, but it is, it is important to talk about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is an issue that's important uh, that I've grappled with because that's sort of the world I live in. And I, you get with some of the people that are involved in this and it gets pretty depressing pretty quick. So yeah. we've got uh, this program, at least we did before COVID, it'll ramp back up again when it's all taken care of, I think. But where we gathered environmental studies, graduate students and seniors that were in these degree programs that would be going out and being in agencies and working for consulting firms or whatever. And the whole mission of the little weekend retreats we we were doing was how do you deal with this <laughs> issue and, and, and be able to, you know, be happy at the end of the day? And I think what matters is you, uh, okay, to 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 push the envelope here. I was backpacking in the Sierras for 10 days by myself. And a friend of mine didn't was gonna go, but he didn't. It was the best, one of the best experiences of my life, just being by myself. You know, the thought that I could fall and trip and no one would find me and I'd die gave me a sense of freedom that I, I haven't had in a long time. Anyway, I was going up this pass. It was Colby Pass. Just It was horrible. And it was my eighth day or something. I was so tired. I thought, I just, I, I can't make it. I just, and I kept looking up at the pass. And if, if you've done hiking, you know, you, you look ahead. Oh, there it is. And it, it's a false pass, right? Yeah, yeah. This stupid chipmunk races by me on this switchback trail and he stops at every turn almost and he sits there with his little face and his little hands and then he takes off again you know I, you know i'm thinking you jerk you know <laughs> i've got you know 50 pounds on my back i'm tired i'm not gonna make it and then it, i sat down and it dawned to me you know i've got a vision problem i'm focusing on this big picture i'm never gonna get there I got to focus on these little goals I can handle. So, okay, I'm going to take 10 steps. Rejoice in that moment when I get to the 10th step. Stop. I'm going to rest. And you know what happened? The, the, the summit took care of itself. So you, you've got to hang on to things that can bring you value, validation and joy that you can actually control. So, you know, if we all do that, the climate change crisis, I think, will get resolved by itself. If we each and every one of us decides what's the thing that's going to get me through the day that can help me change the world in a positive way, it's going to make me feel good. So what I do is I I love teaching and I'm trying to train environmental studies people that are going to go out in the world and affect change in a way that will help them be resilient. And I've got all these little techniques I do and discussions and stuff. And every person I work with and I deal with, it feels good, you know? And I, maybe it's delusional, I don't know, but it keeps me going. Otherwise I'd sit in my house and end up drinking way too much whiskey or something. (laughs) Uh, And everybody could do that, um, but there's just so much negativity now, you just have to come around in a way that's gonna provide you some insulation. But it's solvable, I, I really do believe that. It's just that you just can't get overwhelmed by it, I think. That's how I, I deal with it. 
Yeah. And I mean, you do a good job. I've seen you talk. You you have an ability to get people excited about things that maybe aren't very exciting. <laughs> oh, that's you great. I mean? yeah. And uh, and it's true. It's I think it's this is literally the most important thing people, a skill people should have or, or they should hone. It's storytelling. And uh, mm. it, it's super important. A lot of time. You know, you'll hear scientists on uh, on TV, on news, on on social media, and they're not the best as, at telling a story because they're they're just giving you facts and they're giving right. you numbers and graphs, and people get lost. You know, they're like, I don't know what this is. What <laughs> you know, it's like it's so you need a story. You need to 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 get you know a, a burning koala is worth more than a billion graphs. It's just, oh yeah, you know, that's not comparable. So I feel like if people were to just get better at telling a story, getting people emotionally invested in essentially helping themselves, you know, by doing everyday things that could help the environment in the areas that, you know, that they uh, live. So that's just my two cents on the matter. (laughs) Well, you know, that's perfect. Um, And I will add one thing that uh, before you can get connected to nature again, which is sort of my mantra, you got to fix the internal environment. And and I'm talking about ourselves. You know, when people are arguing, they're, for the most part, not arguing what they're arguing about. Yeah. You know, there's something going on inside of them that is unresolved, and we've all got them. And some of us have learned how to find that and kind of work through it. And some of us have found our own gurus to guide us in that direction or, or therapy or, but honestly, most of us are the walking wounded, right? <laughs> and we react to the world in our own picture that exists nowhere else other than between our two ears. And we think that's reality. And the way you hear people talk at each other now, it's just, it's mind blowing. I mean, they, we really are on different worlds, every single one of us. And then when you realize that, that the person who's flipping you off and saying horrible things to you, uh, it's not about you. It's about the pain that they've got inside. And so, you know, <laughs> not being a psychologist, or <laughs> you know, I, I just will say that we need to spend some work on ourselves in that regard. And, and it's hard, especially for guys, because, you know, we've got this persona that gets us through the day. But sometimes that's the problem. It gets us through the day and we don't read. <laughs> deal with the stuff that's making us having to get through the day. Um, yeah. But anyway, so there's that. That's that's a whole other episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Rick, man, I want to thank you so much. This was great. Super insightful. Um, yeah, I really learned a lot. This was a really fun episode. Where can people find you? Where can they find more information about Chaparral? Uh, maybe get involved. Yeah, give us some good places. Well, I just fixed the Wikipedia page on Chaparral, so that's <laughs> that's one place they can go. There was a lot of misconceptions there. I've got some papers you can download, uh, but that's that's the quick version. Uh, we have a website. It's CaliforniaChaparral.org, and it's one P, two R's, A L. Everybody, I won't say what they do, but that's what you should do. Oh, I, um, I, mis- I misspelled it like six times. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you can, you know, type in Halsey, like the Admiral and Chaparral, and you'll find find us. And the website's got all sorts of pirated uh, science papers you normally have to pay for. You can just continue to steal from until I get notified otherwise. Um, and it's a good resource. And there's all sorts of stuff on protecting your home if that's where you want to go. And if, you know, if you, honestly, it's I tried to make the website in a way that anybody who lives anywhere, like in the Appalachians or whatever, it, you know, it it was just me and my dog that started this thing. Yeah. And I it's really a celebration of my local environment that I love. And and it, and it it's a great model I think for people anywhere, you know, find the place you really love cuz most people don't know much about anything in that regard. And make it your cause to help people enjoy the estuaries in in Louisiana or the forests in Appalachia or the you know, what are those called the, the azalea Azalea, I think they have azalea or something. There's barrens on slopes in the Appalachians, actually. I have a picture of it on my website because it's kind of like a shrubland. <laughs> um, you know, so that you can go there. And then I have a book and a bunch of papers you can you can buy or you can steal. You can join our organization. And I send you a free book with a autograph that doesn't cost anything. <laughs> 
guys, yeah, go follow, go to these places, get involved, learn a little bit more. It's super interesting and actually super important as well. So again, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's an honor, right? Thank you. Thanks so much, man. Bye.